Great Feast of Trinity Sunday. End of Easter time. Easter ended yesterday night, and now we're in the time after Pentecost. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. O oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How incomprehensible are his judgments, and how unsearchable his ways! For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and recompense shall be made to him? Made him. For of him, and by him, and in him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. In the Gospel, second that according to St. Matthew, chapter 28. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Going therefore teach you all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. As for the words of the Holy Gospel. read a little bit from the Athanasian Creed on this Trinity Sunday, which we say in the Divine Office. Probably won't do the whole thing because it's very late, but this is the Athanasian Creed. Whoever wishes to be saved must before else all, uh, all else adhere to the Catholic faith. He must preserve this faith whole and untarnished, otherwise he shall most certainly perish forever. Now this is the Catholic faith, that we worship one God in Trinity, and trinity and unity, neither confusing the persons nor distinguishing the nature. The person of the Father is distinct, the person of the Son is distinct, the person of the Holy Ghost is distinct. Yet the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost possess one Godhead, equal glory and co-eternal majesty. As the Father is, so is the Son, so also is the Holy Ghost. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, the Holy Ghost is uncreated. The Father is infinite, the Son is infinite, the Holy Ghost is infinite. Nevertheless, there are not three eternals, but one eternal, even as there are not three uncreateds or three infinites, but one uncreated and one infinite. So likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, and the Holy Ghost is almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So also the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet there are not three gods, but only one God. So too the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Ghost is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but only one Lord. The Father was made by no one, being neither created nor begotten. The Son is from the Father alone, though not created or made, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is from the Father and the Son, though neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Consequently, there is one Father, not three fathers. There is one Son, not three sons. There is one Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. Furthermore, in this trinity there is no before or after, no greater or less, for all three persons are co-eternal and co-equal. In every respect, therefore, as has already been stated, unity must be worshipped in trinity, and trinity in unity. This is what everyone who wishes to be saved must hold regarding the blessed trinity. Now the true faith requires us to believe and acknowledge that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is both God and man. He is God begotten of the substance of the Father before the world began. He is man born in the world of the substance of his mother. Perfect God and perfect man, a substance composed of a rational soul and a human body, equal to the Father in divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. And although he is God and man, still he is one Christ, not two. One, not by any turning of the divinity into flesh, but by the taking up of humanity into God. One only, not by any confusion of substance, but by the unity of his person. For just as a rational soul and the body form one man, so God and man form one Christ. He suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose from the dead on the third day, ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father, all-powerful, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming all men must rise with their bodies and must give an account of their own deeds. Those who have done good shall go into eternal life, while those who have done evil shall go into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith, and anyone who does not believe it fully and firmly cannot be saved. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. They are taken always on Trinity Sunday and read the Athanasian Creed, which explains great detail the Blessed Trinity, a mystery that we cannot understand fully. And on this Sunday, the first Sunday after Pentecost, the octave of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Ghost, we contemplate this mystery, the Trinity, the most blessed Trinity, as you saw, that we worship in unity, unity and Trinity and Trinity and unity, something that's above our knowledge that we cannot nor will ever be able to understand. So just one quick point about this Sunday, because it's late. Faith needs to be rooted deep in humility. Without humility, you cannot have faith. Without humility, you cannot have a spiritual life. St. Paul says in the epistle, O oh, unsearchable are his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? There's a lot of problem nowadays with, of course, the era of modernism and the errors of liberalism in this world. Why? Because of pride. St. Pius X says pride and modernism, they sit in each other's house like they were its own. If you wish to be free from the errors of today's world, you must remain in humility. You have to be humble. Humble humility comes from the Latin word humus, which means dirt. And if you think about the spiritual life like a tree, the dirt has to be there for the roots to take root. There has to be good soil. The roots are the faith. And your faith has to be rooted in humility, otherwise your tree will die. Your spiritual life will die. And you will not be able to keep the faith if you do not remain humble. Humility is a necessary step to the spiritual life and to faith. What is faith? Faith is the ascent of the intellect, prompted by the will to believe whatever God has revealed. That is the actual definition of the act of, act of faith. Is the, is the ascent of the intellect prompted by the will to believe what God, ever God has revealed. That ascent of the intellect cannot happen without humility. Those who become proud, they can't understand. And that's the worst thing for them. Remember the story of the devil. He, the worst thing the devil can be is confused. He can't stand it. A proud person, when you confuse them, is the most miserable thing in the world. Proud cannot stand confusion. It's the opposite of pride. Because being the proud, being the proud one, you got to be the best. you got to have the most knowledge. you got to be the most skilled. you got to be the expert. That's where modernism comes into play. Modernists are experts in every field. They know everything. And they're going to tell you how to reform your lives. They just don't know how to reform their own. But the devil hates confusion. Remember the story of the, of the woman who was about to go to confession, but was, was turmoil and back and forth and back and forth. And finally she said, I'm going to confession. She stood up to go to confession. The devil appeared to her and said, where are you going? And she said, I'm going to cleanse my soul and send you into all confusion. Because when you confess your sins and your sins are washed out, the devil, who is the accuser, called so by the Holy Ghost, has nothing to accuse and therefore he becomes confused. Therefore, powerless in his pride, he cannot stand it. It destroys his pride more than anything to be confused. The pride, proud cannot stand confusion. Now, confusion is not in itself a good thing, but a lack of understanding is part of our human nature. That's the problem with pride in the spiritual life. St. Paul himself says that God's ways are unsearchable. His ways are not known. Oh, inestimable. If I'm saying that right. Oh, his ways are unsearchable. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given him advice? No one. So when it comes to the Catholic faith, when it comes to the Blessed Trinity, something we can't understand, when you have a certain level of pride and you can't understand, you don't believe. To be able to have the faith, you have to believe and therefore submit your intellect. That requires humility. Dirt. You have to, and that's where we come from. Remember in Ash Wednesday, Momento homo qui povis et in povetem reviteris. Remember, man, that thou art dust, and unto dust thou shalt return. I like to say that when we're playing soccer. <laughs> While we're running, and I accidentally trip one of the seminary teams. <laughs> Remember, man, that thou art dust, and unto dust thou shalt return. So, you know, get up and quit crying. But when we put the ashes on the forehead, we do that for a reason, to remind us that we are dust. We came from dust, and guess what? We're going back to dust. When we die, we're going to turn to dust. And so, you know, sometimes you get a big old ad, a big old glob of ash on your forehead and you walk around all day with it. And I remember one of the servers, he, he was, you know, we always go back and forth. And I think he told me something, my father, make sure, you know, you don't mark me, you know, too, too much. And we were going back and forth. So when I saw him out of the corner of my eye, as I was going back the other way, I grabbed the biggest pinch of ash I can get. And I smeared his forehead so nice and, you know, that he would, 
be mm. humble, right? Humility. As he went back, Father Pancras even was smiling. I thought it was good. So, <laughs> humility, the importance of humility. We are dirt. We're going to become dirt. We have to remain that way. And St. Pius X warns in his encyclical against modernism, which is the fight we're fighting, the error of the modernists and the liberals and ecumenism, the errors of our time. It's rooted in pride. And he warns us faithful, priests, and you faithful. He warns you, if you do not practice humility and you let your pride go out of control, you will start to fall into those errors. And we all think, well, we're traditional. We're saying mass in a catacomb for Pete's sake. Under in the basement. We think we're good. We're traditional. We have the faith. He warns you still in 1910. He warned him. 1917. St. Pius X warned the faithful then. If you do not keep your pride in check, you will fall for the errors of modernism. In ways that maybe you don't realize. You don't come out right away and become a full-blown modernist. But you'll fall for some of the errors. You have to be on guard. And because we live in a world, we're in a, we're in a society. We're affected. It's like when you go to a swamp. You're not necessarily going to dive into the swamp and get covered in dirt right away. But when you go into a swamp, what happens? You're going to get mosquito bites. You're going to get, you know, dirt on you. We live in a swamp of a world. We're going to get a little bit infected. And if we don't keep guard against it, we will become completely enveloped in the swamp. That's how it works. You go to the store. You go to the mall. What, of course, the mall. But even if you go to the grocery store, the gas station, you take a walk outside your house, you cannot help but see the world. And therefore, it gets into you. You breathe it in. It's just how it works. So therefore, we have to constantly be cleansing, studying, praying, reading the Catholic faith, and studying the, the mysteries of the faith to keep it in our blood. And most of importantly, we must remain humble. Every, all of us, everyone in this room right now is proud. We have to admit it. We all suffer from pride. Everyone does. The... That's part of it. But there, it had, the important part is it must be fought against. Your pride has to be attacked. You have to realize, I am proud, and I have to fight against it. Crush my pride, because if I don't, I will fall into errors. Those who say, I don't understand God. I can't understand the Catholic faith. Therefore, I do not believe. It's pride. The modernist is an expert. He comes to you and he says, I'm an expert in these fields, and I'm going to show you the truth. And I can't, he can't be taught by anyone because he's proud. And he's going to teach you all things because he knows all things, because he's proud. And therefore, he loses his faith. Pride is the root of all evil. Pride From pride comes all other sin, but especially lack of faith and a loss of faith. Because to have faith, to have that tree of the spiritual life, to have the, but the roots, which is faith, that's root, that's the beginning of the tree, there has to be the dirt, humility. Then once the roots can, can root down into the dirt, then it starts to grow, which is hope, the trunk of the tree, and then produce fruit, which is charity, the queen of the virtues, right? That's a good way to compare it, to understand it. But there must be first humility. St. Pius X warns so greatly, and he warns the priest too. In the seminary, he says, St. Pius X, and most popes, you know, when they, when they come to a correction, they slap you on the wrist, and say, don't do that. And if you continue to do that, you're going to get punished. But don't do that. Correct yourself. No, don't do that. Stop doing that. Correct yourself. And if they're going to continue to do that, well, you have to take measures. St. Pius X doesn't do that. St. Pius X was so unforgiving in this encyclical. He, he said, in it with, and I quote, without compassion, without compunction. He said, he's referring to a seminarian. He said, if you have a seminarian in your seminary, who has, this, who has the sin of pride. And I don't mean a normal pride that all of us have. We all are too proud. We have to admit it and fight it. But he's talking about a pride that's not fought. He says, if you see a cleric that has pride, he says, he's out. Kick him out. He's gone. He's not to become a priest. With no compunction. Boot to the behind to the door. No compunction. And that's very rare. Because seminarians are weak sinners. We get a lot of chances. Priests are sinners. And I'm a priest. We made it through the... But he says, but when it comes to the pride, he says, no, they are not to be ordained priests. Kick them out with, in, without compunction. You're not even supposed to feel bad for them. Bye-bye. Go. That's how serious St. Pius X is, was about, this, was about the sin of pride. Because of the error of modernism, especially in our times. And if he says they already are priests, he said, depose them. 
If they're in a high position, give them a low one. Let them realize and learn by their low position their error and mistake in being proud. Because pride, modernism sits in pride like in its own house. The errors of our time will get into our blood if we start to think we're something more than we are. Humility is just reality, right? There's such thing as a false humility, where you can think too lowly of yourself as it were. But it's a false way of looking at yourself. Humility is truth. And the truth is, we are dirt. We come from it. We're going back to it. But to, you can exaggerate and have a false humility, which is really pride. So the, my point is, humility is truth. It's reality. It's looking at the world how it is and understanding that we are dust. And when God says something, it is. Let there be light. And light was. It's not just because when God speaks... He happens to be right because he knows. That's part of it. He, of course, has infinite knowledge. It's when God speaks. If it wasn't before, it is now. When God said, let there be light, when there wasn't light, there was light now. Because God's word is truth. So when he says, he's the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and one God, we say, yes, we believe. Remember the Jews and the Protestants when prime examples of the ones who would say, I do not understand, therefore I do not believe. The Jews, firstly, when he said he was a man. I am God made man. They said that that's impossible. That's not becoming. That's not fitting for a God to do that. It's not fitting for a God to become man. Therefore, you're a blasphemer and you have a devil. It is not fitting. They could not understand in their reason why God, and it's very, to, put it, to go to the conclusion of my point, it is unreasonable, by the way what Christ did. It was foolish. And I know that sounds horrible the way I'm saying it, but it was. Christ became man, and it was foolish. They could not understand, and therefore they could not be. God, no, you can't do it that way. St. Peter did that to Christ, because it comes from the devil first. The devil was the first one to do it. And I said the Jews, but the devil in the beginning of time. Remember, it was said that God told the angels, I'm going to become a man. And I'm, you're going to have to worship me as man. And my mother is going to be a human creature that will be your queen. And the devil said, that shall not be, no, that's not right. You shouldn't do that. That goes against reason. And he had an angelic intuition. He had an angelic intellect. And he said, that's not right. That doesn't make sense. No, you shouldn't do that. They tried to tell God what to do. Next was the Jews, when he became man. They said, no, God should not be man. That's not right. It's not fitting. Then Christ said, I will become your food. And most left at that time, and even still to this day, the Protestants. They say, no, that's not right. That's not fitting. <clears throat> How can you say that you eat your God? That is not right. That's not fitting. That goes against reason. God, no. No. That cannot be. And remember, St. Peter did that as well. When Christ said, I'm going to the cross and I'm going to die on the cross. St. Peter said, Lord, don't go to the cross. Don't go to the cross. That's not smart. Win the, win the people another way. You can be a master. You can be a teacher. You're a miracle worker. Don't go to the cross. And what did, what did Christ call him? He said, get behind me, Satan, because that's exactly what Satan did at the beginning of time. Don't do that. That's not a good idea. He didn't say, I don't think you're God. He said, God, you're wrong. And I don't think you should do that. And it goes against my understanding. Pride. The devil's fault was pride. St. Peter's was more of a mistake because he was a bumbling idiot. We give him, you know, we, he, he made up for it. But the devil's pro problem was pride. He said, God, you're not doing it right. That's where error comes from. God, you're not doing it right. I do not believe. I cannot understand. But here's the point. Unsearchable are his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? You say, to become man was foolish. God shouldn't do that. That's unbecoming of God. Okay. I can understand mm -hmm. that. God should not be our food. That's unbecoming. It's not fitting. I can agree with you there too. Lawrence of Justinian says, Christ did what he did out of love. And love does not go where it ought, but where it is drawn. Love does not go where it ought, but love goes where it's drawn. Christ was drawn to do those things out of love, not his reason. 
it wasn't repugnant to reason by no means. God couldn't do something like that. That goes against reason. But it, it seems to us uh, beyond what God should do. At the Last Supper, when he said, I have desired to eat this pass with you, with the desire of desire to eat this pass with you, it was said out of a, an enamored heart. An enamored heart. His heart was so in love that it was enamored. And what happens to a heart that's an enamored? A young guy falls in love with a young girl. What does he do? Stupid things, right? Stupid things when you're in love, right? Christ became a fool because he was in love with our souls. And he says so through St. Paul, who is his priest. And that goes for us too. He said, you say you're fools. I am more a fool because I am like Christ. And Christ was a fool. Christ, they put on the white garment before Herod, which was basically the equivalent of a straitjacket at the time. Those who wore that meant they were in the nut house. And they put one on Christ to mock him. And Christ didn't take it off, and he didn't say anything. Because he is a fool. Because his wisdom is not to be understood by them. He doesn't need a counselor. He doesn't need advice. And his love is foolish. That's why St. Paul says, I am also a fool. And that's why the priest wears this. Because the priest gives up a life, a wife, a family to become a fool at the altar. Unsearchable are his ways. What he did was foolish. But because he's God and we're dust, see the difference there? And when he says, this is how it is, we assent our intellect, prompted by our will, and we say, I believe. I believe because thou art God who has revealed these things, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. What you did, I don't understand. Why you're going to the cross, I don't get it. You could have shed one drop of blood, and it would have been over. You're doing all of that, I don't get it. But yes. Even St. Michael, I'm going along, I always do this, but last point. Even St. Michael didn't get it fully right. He wasn't mistaken. We say that we, you know, study in the retreat. Remember, when God told the angels, "I'm going to become man," Saint Michael said, uh, "Okay, answer. It's pretty good. Fifty points, not all the way there, though. It's pretty good." Saint Michael said, "Who is?" He said, "Who is like unto God?" God said, "He's going to become man." He's looking at the other angels. I don't, I don't get it, but who's like God? You know, He's God. We let Him do whatever He wants, right? So he said, "Okay." He made a right answer. He's a good angel. He's still a good angel, and actually quite a powerful one. Saint Michael, one of the highest ones in heaven. Now. But he said, who is like unto God? That wasn't the perfect answer. That wasn't the perfect answer. There was one who had the perfect answer. I'm sure you can guess who is above St. Michael. One. And that was Our Lady. When our, the angel Gabriel came and told Our Lady, God's going to become man in you, and you're going to be his mother. She gave the perfect answer. She said, Fiat mi kise verbum tum. She said, if God wants to do it, let it be done. Let it be done. That was the perfect answer. Because she had humility. If God says so, so be it. That's it. And the more we don't fight our pride, dear faithful, and the more you let your pride grow root in you, because pride's sneaky. Remember, pride's ugly. Nobody likes a proud man. When they see a big old proud guy walk in, you just want, you, you know, want to show him some humility showing some dirt but we all are proud the problem is we hide it because we know it's ugly and so when we see it in ourselves we know it's ugly so we, we, we bury it so recognize we have to continue to fight this vice pride is in all of us recognize your pride fight your pride it's most important that we can hold on to our faith whole and entire and not be infected with the errors of this time not be infected because if you just live in this world, walking around this world, you will be infected. You will be. It just gets in without you even realizing it. So to prevent that, you have to constantly fight your pride, study your faith, recognize and see that when God says something, that's it. It's because he's God. We don't need to understand. It's not above my, it's not above our dignity or something that I, 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 I should understand this. That was, again, Satan's problem, the Jews, Protestants, any other heretics. That's their problem. Not that they don't think that it's 
that he's God, but that God's doing it wrong, and it doesn't make sense to them. Therefore, they don't believe. And we're going to get infected if we don't fight. So fight the sin of pride, the root of all evil. Pray for the grace of humility. Today, celebrate with great joy. Easter's over. I'm very sad. I'm heartbroken. I love Easter. But the Alleluia's were all dropped. But today is a first-class feast, Trinity Sunday. It's a great feast. We celebrate the greatest mystery of the entire faith, the most blessed Trinity. And you can find that in Athanasian Creed if you want to read it later. You know, it's the whole thing. It's in the Missal. We'll show you after. You can find the Athanasian Creed and read it and pay attention to it. And also read the epistle. Read the epistle of today's Mass over and over and over again. How unsearchable are his ways. Who has been a counselor to the Lord? Or who has known the mind of the Lord? Oh, how wonderful and admirable are his ways. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.